Hello, everyone. Welcome to our live broadcast of Live Stories Worldwide. It's great to have you with us. My name is Alan Jones. We bring you stories from all different parts of the world, stories of different things that people have gone through in their life, the struggles they've had with pain, discouragement, abuse, and many other struggles, but also how they've been come through them and how their lives have been transformed. We have a story today that's coming to you from Budapest, Hungary. Our stories can be viewed again and again on our YouTube channel, Live Stories at Lunch, and we encourage you to subscribe to that channel and don't forget to press the, the bell that we, you can be notified when we are alive. You can also listen to these broadcasts on Spotify, Live Stories Worldwide Radio. We do invite you to join and tell your friends to join and subscribe to Live Stories. So I said today we have a guest who isn't uh, born, he wasn't born in Hungary, but he's, he's there at the moment. He was raised in the Isle of Skye in Scotland. And I'm going to hand over to Murdo now, Murdo McLeod, and George is going to interview him. So welcome, Murdo and George. Hello, everybody. Hi, Murdo. Hi, George. First of all, let me welcome you to Life Stories Worldwide. It's not often we get um, people from the continent, but uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Oh, well, it's my pleasure. Thank you very much. Now, uh, as Alan said, you're in Budapest at the moment. Are you in Buda or in Pest itself? Uh, I'm in Pest, to be precise. Pest is on one side of the river, Buda's on the other, so I'm on the Pest side. Excellent. But you didn't um, always live in Budapest, of course. We believe you were born in Glasgow, is that correct? I was, yes. I was born in Glasgow and I was raised there until I was eight. Uh, and then my family moved up to the Isle of Skye in the north of Scotland. And I've been here in Budapest since 2019. So that's uh, the beginning, the middle and the end of my story. <laughs> nice and short. Thank you very much. Um, tell us a little bit of what it was like growing up in Glasgow. Uh, sure. Uh, the life of someone who's below the age of eight is typically contained to the house. So my adventures in Glasgow were not... Um, wandering about the city centre or doing anything very exciting or Glasgow related. I was uh, brought up in a Christian family. My dad was the minister of the, the local church and um, I had a brother and sister, both younger than me, and we had a fairly normal uh, life, I guess, for an eight-year-old. I mean, uh, my favourite food was pasta and uh, we used to play with the kids out the back of the, of the house. Um, but I guess um, the one key difference I, fr from an early age that I noticed about the upbringing that we had is that a lot of the other kids around us, they weren't Christians. They didn't have that as part of their uh, sort of upbringing, whereas we did. It was a massive part of our life growing up that we were in this sort of Christian environment. Um, it wasn't just a case of going to church on Sundays. It was every day that before we went out to school, we would all read the Bible together as a family and pray. And then in the evenings, again, we would do the same thing before we went to bed. So when I was very, very young, this was perfectly normal. I just assumed this was what everybody did. And it was only after going to school that I realized, no, this is pretty unusual activity. Um, so I began to realize that uh, our family was quite unique in some ways. Yeah, did you feel a bit... Um as you say, different when you were at school to the other kids? I mean, I guess so. I think at that age, there's a, a very limited so, sort of social understanding mm -hmm. that you've got. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think, I, think uh, I was aware from a very early age that our family was not your sort of normal family. We were a bit odd, a little bit different. And uh, <laughs> I guess I, I, I've always been a little bit odd and a little bit different all the way through my life. So uh I, I can trace it right back to these early days excellent now of course um you said your dad was a minister is that with the church of scotland is that correct uh it was the free church the free church of scotland yeah so that's a, a um a, an evangelical church uh, it's a, a presbyterian church and it was quite a strict church i suppose in some mm -hmm. ways 
necessarily across the whole uh, church, but certainly in our in our family, it was quite a. a, um, a we, we took it very very seriously. Uh, Christianity. It wasn't just a cultural thing, but it was uh, that we actually really did believe these things that were spoken in the Bible, and um, and tried to work out how to put that into practice in a sort of day to day life. That was the environment, the, the family environment. And then in the church setting as well, quite a traditional old school kind of church. Mm -hmm. We would sing psalms. There were no hymns. There were no musical instruments in the church. No, no organ, for example. And uh, all the ladies would wear hats and skirts. It was, you know, a very traditional kind of church setting to grow up in. And of course, at the age of eight, how did your dad break the news to you that you were actually moving to the Isle of Skye? Hmm. You know, I'm not sure I quite remember that moment. I do remember <laughs> sitting in the bath and thinking, I won't be having very many baths in this bath. Uh, I did have baths once I went to Sky, but it was in a different bath. So, uh, yeah, so I guess I must have been in the bath when I, uh, when I first heard them. And, of course, you had lots of friends at school and in Glasgow, and you moved to the other Sky. Was that a big culture shock to you at, that, at the age of eight? Um. Yes and no. I don't think it was a massive culture shock because my dad was from the Isle of Lewis. And so when we were kids on holiday, we would typically go up to the Isle of Lewis on summer and mm -hmm. uh, therefore island life was quite familiar to me. I think what was new was the idea that this is our home now. And mm -hmm. so I remember on the first morning that we'd moved up to Sky and I woke up and I heard Life Stories. Life Stories Worldwide is broadcast live every Monday night at 8 p.m. UK time. We are live on Facebook, Zoom and YouTube. So why not join us every Monday night at 8 p.m. The sound of seagulls uh, outside my window, that's what woke me up. And I woke up and I looked out and I could see the sea. And I thought, I could get used to this. I, I quite like this, actually. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, it was a very different world growing up in the Isle of Skye to growing up in Glasgow. But because my grandparents still lived down in Glasgow, I always had that sort of halfway um, mm -hmm. experience. So in in Skye, I was always considered to be a bit of an incomer, I suppose, because I hadn't been born there. I had arrived there when I was eight. And so there was always that sort of, I wouldn't say stigma, that's putting it too harshly, but that sort of character that uh, I, I'm one of the incomers. So I wasn't mm -hmm. completely at home there. But then down in Glasgow, they would hear my accent and they would uh, say, oh, he's from the Highlands. And so I, I started to realize, oh, well, that's not my home either. Uh, so it was uh, an interesting journey, realizing that home is not necessarily somewhere on earth that you can find. It's uh, something a bit more metaphysical. Now, as a young boy, of course, moving to the other sky, did you explore quite a lot up there? Uh, if, yeah, for sure. There's a, a lot of wonderful places up on the Isle of Skye. And growing up there, you get the opportunity to uh, to explore a lot by yourself because there's no real, you know, mm -hmm. threat from uh, axe murderers or whatever. So you can just you can wander <laughs> about and see see what's on the uh, down at the shore or on the moors. And yeah, we had we had a lot of freedom. And then once we got our bikes and we were able to cycle around we used to uh, go off on little adventures like that as well so it, it was there's so much to see on the isle of sky it's a very very beautiful place now as you say you grew up in a christian family was it very regimented like of do's and don'ts or was it was it freer than that i think it did have a certain do's and don'ts kind of quality to it mm -hmm. um it wasn't only do's and don'ts but certainly that was that was a large factor in it um, I think what I would say, I, I don't want to mischaracterize anything, and I would say that the do's and don'ts originated because of something deeper. 
it wasn't that Christianity was only do's and don'ts, but because there was this underlying belief in uh, sin and in grace and in God's love and sort of these massive concepts, that that then translates into everyday life and behavior. And if God loves so much, then how am I to react in this particular situation? Mm -hmm. And so you ended up with some obvious things like don't kill people, don't lie, don't steal, but also some more specific interpretations. So for example, we weren't allowed to go to any of the school dances or we were strongly discouraged from going to any of the uh, local pubs or anything like that. So there were, uh, there were do's and don'ts, but I think they came from a place of genuine faith. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you, uh, were you ever a naughty boy? <laughs> well, who isn't really? Um, yeah. I, I, I'm struggling to remember anything specific uh, uh, or anything that was I didn't mean anything specific, there, but just like but, the fact that you want to find, your, find yourself and find your freedom, if you know what I mean. Yeah, for sure. I mean... I think some of the things, some of the do's and don'ts frustrated me a little bit more than others. Mm -hmm. um, but most of the time I found some way of being able to work, work with them or work around them. Uh, I'm not really the kind of person who enjoys massive conflict. And so I, I didn't mm -hmm. try to uh, pick fights um, unnecessarily. And so I tended just to uh, go for the path of the easiest resistance. Okay, you brought up you were brought up as you say in a Christian home. You learned all about the Bible. Uh, did that give you an advantage over others in becoming a Christian? Do you think? That's an interesting question. Yes, I think so. I think so in the sense that because I knew so much, it no, no it didn't give me an advantage in becoming a Christian. Mm -hmm. But once I became a Christian, I had this massive advantage that I have a huge amount of background knowledge in the Bible. And so I'm able to give put faith into context a little bit. Um, when someone becomes a Christian as an adult, and maybe they don't know the Bible, they've never looked at it, never opened it, there's a huge learning curve. Um, all these people that get mentioned in, in church sermons like Moses or David or Elijah. And mm -hmm. if you've never heard of any of them, that's a huge amount to suddenly start learning all this stuff. It doesn't make you a better person, but it does give you context to, mm -hmm. to the faith. Now, because I'd grown up with all of that, it meant that when I became a Christian for myself and when I, uh, to use the lingo, repented and uh, put my faith in Christ, I already had all this sort of Bible knowledge there mm -hmm. to uh, act as a sort of a, 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 a life raft or something like that, that I could um, use to inform my faith so that I wasn't going in blind. It wasn't a blind faith. And I don't, I think that when I, I never like this term blind faith, I just don't think that it's appropriate for the Christian faith at all. I think that um, True faith is faith in the truth, and therefore mm -hmm. it's very, very important to know the truth and to have yeah. to keep your brain switched on as a Christian. And so, yeah, I, I would say there's a huge advantage in growing up in a Christian family, but it's not the uh, the be all and end all. But surely most people would look at your life. It was a good, clean life. You brought up your father was a preacher you know, a good Christian family, but surely you would be classed as a Christian anyway. Did, did you still have to repent and, you know, as you say, become a Christian? Yeah. So um, one of the things that was really drilled into me as a kid was that being a child of a Christian does not make you a Christian. Mm -hmm. um, that it's, you can't rely on your, you can't rely on your church community, your family, or anything else, uh, if you're going to be a Christian, you need to be in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, no one starts out in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, maybe with a couple of odd exceptions. But uh, it was therefore said to me, well, you are currently on the course to hell, and you need to get onto a course to heaven. And so- Even here, though you were a good I, boy. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, no one is all that good a boy. I, uh, well, to give you one example, I remember at one point I got my brother's head and smashed it against the window until the window broke. 
So uh, there's plenty of times that you can do things that are not uh, not what Jesus would do. Let's put it like that. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Uh, It's very easy to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Life Stories at Lunch, to receive notifications of when we are live. Simply click the bell. I mean, you're looking great tonight. Uh, how are you feeling, yeah, your health-wise? Feeling good, yeah, yeah. Oh, good. Feeling good. And Michael, um, any plans for the future of yourself? Um, my plans uh, is are to write more songs, release more songs, um, but also to share in terms of um, the worship leading perspective. Uh, I lead, at, I participate in leading at church, trying to help other people on that journey to mm -hmm. worship leading and songwriting. So I've worked with um, there were two or three people in my local church who are actually in the process of releasing their own music. So wow. I've been involved with helping to kind of create curate one of the songs for one person and then three songs for another. So just trying to share and give back is my kind of main approach um, to this this stage of my life. I have noticed a lot of, a lot of the um, newer music is, is tending towards country music, actually, toward country yeah. newer music. What would you say your style is then? My, my style is uh, grief. It, it, it's mm -hmm. definitely rooted in gospel music. That's what mm -hmm. I grew up on. Um, but I think I, because I've played with a variety of other people, there's, there are influences of folk and country in there sometimes. I love a good old country song, you can't beat that. Um, uh, popular music as well. I think there's bits of a soul music and bits, bits of jazz. I love jazz as, a, as an art form, uh, as a phenomenal art form. So I think fusing them at the right time in the right space is kind of where I come from. So coming from the Pentecostal community, you jump around and bash the piano and... <laughs> <laughs> Well, put your leg up on the piano, and you know. <laughs> my, my my thumbs decided that bashing the piano too long is not good for you. <laughs> you, you nails break very easily, so I, I try like and uh, can take myself as much as I can. <laughs> well, it's been fantastic speaking to both of you. And um, before you go, I have one question for each of you, and it's the same question basically, and we ask the same question to everybody on the show here. That is, of all the decisions you have made in your life. What's the best decision you have ever made? Shell Marie. To follow Christ. That's the best decision. Best decision I ever made. I, I, I came into knowing who I really was and what I was here to do. That is the best thing because I have friends who still don't know what they're doing mm -hmm. and they need to know Christ. That would just open doors for them. That would give them peace. That would give them just such a, oh, hmm. such a, a strength just makes such a difference. And Michael? Yeah, absolutely. I think that decision to um, follow Jesus, be part of the kingdom of God, and very much alert to the, the, just the vastness of his kingdom, his life purpose. Mm -hmm. um, there, is, there is no 
greater meaning to life until you we discover who Jesus is and what he means for our life. And I know people think it's a bit uh, twee or easy just to fall back on a, a kind of religious um, concept. Mm -hmm. But he, he, Jesus, is real. He is the saviour. He is the son of God. He is in heaven. He does live inside of us and he has an intention for our lives. And our lives only make sense when we allow him to be Lord of our lives. Well, thank you both so uh, very much for speaking to us here at Life Stories Worldwide, of course, and uh, uh, it will be broadcast again and again, and many people will see it worldwide, okay? Fabulous, thank you. So, thank you very much, and with that, I'll just hand back to Alan. Thank, thank you. you, George. Thank you so much, uh, Michael and Shell marie for sharing. It's been great having you with us, great hearing your stories, great hearing how God's using you and blessing you, and pray you continue to do that in your various roles that you're doing. Please stay with us. Uh, before we finish, you're going to hear uh, one of Michael's songs. But I just want to remind you, there's several ways you can contact us. You can contact us on our phone line, plus four four seven nine four three five five zero two eight seven. You can also email us at uh, lifestoriesworldwide at gmail.com. You can visit our website, www.lifestoriesworldwide.com. And there you can find all sorts of information. You can watch other uh, stories that have been on other previous weeks. Many, many stories, all different types of stories. You can join there. We encourage you to subscribe to our Live Stories channel, which is, um, you, it is Live Stories at Lunch, our YouTube channel, Live Stories at Lunch on YouTube. And click the subscription button. And also don't forget to click the bell so we can notify you when we're going to be live. You can also send messages on Facebook at any time. I want to invite you to join us next week again at um, 8 o'clock UK time for another live story, this time from Scotland. Next week we have Murdo McLeod. Murdo McLeod, he was born in the Isle of Skye. After, um, in his teens, he, he, he graduated from a film studio. He went to the... Uh, Film production at Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. And then he formed Trinity Digital after he graduated. And this company has a thematic slogan, exploring Christianity through film. And through this company, um, Murdo has directed and, and produced a number of films. He's also been involved in international TV and film uh, films. He'll show him a lot about that, I'm sure next week. So please tell your friends about next Monday to hear Murdo McLeod. I remember one time actually when I was a child still down in Glasgow, looking out the window and seeing a dog passing by and thinking to myself, I wish I was that dog because when dogs die, they don't go to hell, they just disappear. And <laughs> I knew, and it was drilled into me, that when I die, I'm going to go to hell unless I've repented of my sins. And this was terrifying to me. And so it was very, very important for me to know that I was going to be able to go to heaven when I died. Mm -hmm. um, I, I came to the point of thinking that if only I know that I'm going to go to heaven, then it really doesn't matter what homework levels I get. You know, I could just sort of dance through the classroom and say, there you are, teacher, empty daughter. It really doesn't matter because I'm going to go into heaven when I die. And so this was the, the one thing that was, that was super important for me. Um, but it never really seemed to uh, to change from being a desire to being a sense that, oh, I've mm -hmm. got it now. Yeah. Um, that took a lot longer. And at what stage in your life, I mean, how old were you when you realized that you you, you know you, you needed to do this and that you, you had to make the decision for yourself? How old were you? Um, I, I don't think I can remember a time when I didn't believe that. So... Mm -hmm from the earliest times i mean that was before i was the age of eight looking out the window and seeing this dog so it must have been from the very very earliest times that i had this world view that i was going to go to hell when i died unless i repented um and i remember from as far back as i can remember being taught uh, to pray in the evenings as a family we did this and to pray that my sins would be forgiven and that I would be able to go to heaven. This was a, a set of words that I just simply repeated as part of the prayer. Mm -hmm. And so 
I was quite familiar with asking for forgiveness and asking to go to heaven. But of course, by the time that I got to work out what the words meant, I'd already prayed them so many times that I thought, well, why hasn't anything happened to me already? I see. Um, which was the situation that I was in for probably quite a few years that I was thinking, well, I have prayed and nothing's happened. I haven't, I don't feel that I'm a Christian. So what, what more do I need to do? And uh, I remember asking my uncle this, who was another minister. He was, uh, you know, a very sort of, he was, he was quite a well-renowned minister. You know, he was one that would get invited out to all the, uh, the big fancy churches. Mm -hmm. And, um, he was eating a packet of chips uh, up in the Isle of Lewis. And he, I don't think he, get, he had chips very often, so he was really, really enjoying them. But uh, <laughs> he asked me if I was a Christian. And I said, uh, no, I don't think I am, but I, I do want to be. And uh, I, I sort of said to him what I've said to you just now is, that, you know, what more do I need to do? And he, you know, he was guzzling his chips. And in between his chips, he just said, you've got to pray more. And then just carried on guzzling. <laughs> and I was thinking, that's a terrible advice. I, want to, I wanted the key. I wanted to understand what the real answer was. But looking back on it, I think he, he was right. That is the answer, is you just you carry on praying until something happens, as they say. And um, I remember there was one time where I was reading The Lord of the Rings, which is my favorite book still is. And um, I... I realized that I couldn't even concentrate on the words on the page because I was thinking so much. It doesn't matter whether I'm enjoying this book or not, because I'm still going mm -hmm. to go to hell unless Christ has saved me. And, um, and then I got down on my knees. I, you know, I don't normally do that. This was a, a big sort of thing. I'm doing this now. So I put the book to one side, got down on my knees and prayed that God would forgive me. And, uh, after a little while, my mum shouted through lunchtime and I was like, Oh, well, lunchtime <laughs> and got back up and went for lunch um but at, by that stage i'd said well i have actually prayed as much as i can pray so i don't really know what what more to do and um later that afternoon we we went out cycling um a couple of us from the family we were cycling down a, a hill and it was suddenly as if i'd cycled out of a world of black and white into a world of color it just suddenly for no reason whatsoever everything seemed green. Changed. Yes, mm -hmm. the grass was greener and the sky was bluer and everything just seemed alive with a sort of a music. And um, I felt maybe maybe God has answered this prayer. Um, there was, I came to the conclusion that because I've asked Jesus to forgive me, then if I get to heaven, uh, to, if I die and I'm in front of the judgment seat and he says, no, no, off to hell with you, I can say, hang on a second. You said you promised that anyone who asks for forgiveness will be saved. And I've asked for forgiveness. So you have to save me now. That's, that's, the, that's the bargain. That's the deal. And, and therefore, I must already be forgiven. And so in a weird twist of logic, I came to the conclusion that I was already forgiven without ever having noticed. That realization fell upon you. Mm, and yeah. how, how did your life change after that? I think outwardly, maybe people wouldn't have seen a huge amount of change. Mm -hmm. but inwardly, I think there was a big change. There was no more that fear of death or that fear of hell. Instead, there was, uh, and, and there still is a trust that God will do what is right and ultimately see me through whatever else happens. So the, beforehand, I used to have night terrors. I was terrified of vampires and zombies and axe murderers. And I used to sleep against the wall with my um, duvet rolled up underneath my uh my chin like that. And the reason was that if any vampires came in, they wouldn't be able to get to my throat because it was all tucked up against my, my, uh, my, <laughs> my duvet. After that, I, I didn't mind. Um, I was like, vampires come and get me. It's okay. I'm going to go to heaven. And so there was a change inside, I would say. And maybe that 
had some effect on the outside, but. Uh, mm -hmm. Life Stories.